So I just want to talk to you about flowers and their symbolism in art. Um, now, this was from a three-week course. Well, I'm going to try and break it down into a very short um, lecture for you today. So flower and symbolism, the language of flowers, is sometimes and often called floriography. And it's a kind of a means of cryptological communication through the use of or arrangement of flowers. And meaning has been attributed to flowers for thousands of years. And some form of floriography has been practised in traditional cultures throughout Europe, Asia and the Middle East. How did it all start? Well, the meaning of flowers in Christian art and religious iconography began about two centuries after the death of Jesus Christ, meaning that flowers in Christian art and religious iconography was originally based on the classical art styles and imagery used by the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. In the period encompassing medieval art, iconography began to be standardised and to relate more closely to the texts found in the Bible and became the basis for many of the images found in the meanings of flowers in Christian art. So a flower in Christian art at this point is used to represent abstract ideas or concepts. A picture that represents an idea that's fundamental to understanding the icons and images found in Christian art. And a religious icon, by the way, is an image or symbolic represent representation with sacred significance. The meanings, origins and ancient traditions surrounding flowers in Christian art date back to early times when the majority of ordinary people ordinary people were not able to read or write properly and printing was unknown so the art symbols were there to give an idea if you couldn't read you knew what the symbol meant the floriography and these symbols and icons were borrowed or drawn from early pre-christian traditions so let's take a look at a painting here so this is Jus uh, van Cleef uh, the Madonna and Child now here we have some floriography. The red flowers held by Christ and the Virgin are single carnations, dianthus, which were commonly known as nagelbloem, the hail flower, because they resembled the serrated edges of a medieval nail. The nail flower, sorry, not the hail flower. Um, the white flowers are probably members of the mustard seed family. And... The Latin name for those is Cruciferi, and these symbolic references uh, refer to the Passion and the Crucifixion, and therefore are quite openly accessible to view uh, the flowers, and people would understand them. And the infant reaches for its mother and for three cherries. And the number is associated with the Trinity, of course, and the fruit with Paradise. On the account of the red colour and juice, the cherry suggested the blood of the Redeemer. On account of the sweetness of its fruit, the cherry was a symbol of sweetness to be derived from good works. The cherry also, also symbolised spring, and it's the first tree that bears fruit after winter. So because of this symbolism, the cherry became the fruit of the Annunciation and Incarnation of Christ. Now his affection for Mary and her association with salvation has already doctrinal implications here. And the child seems to flee two flowers in his mother's right hand to a believer he has every reason to fear. Pink carnations have the most symbolic historical significance and according to Christian legend, carnations first appeared on earth Jesus when, uh, as Jesus carried the cross. The Virgin Mary shed tears at Jesus' plight and the carnation sprang up from where her tears fell. So the pink carnation became the symbol of a mother's undying love. And if you notice here, above that carnation, or almost growing out of the carnation, we have another flower. Now that is the passion flower. Now when travellers um, of the Spanish conqueror in Mexico found a relative of the carnation with a deeper red and spinier petals, they could hardly resist naming it the passion flower. Now here, this miraculous flower tops the older one, so it could be growing out the same stem as if the stem had burst through. And here, the virgin and child with Saints Jerome and Dominic, we have a little bit here. So here we've got the Virgin Mary in the centre, in the middle of this landscape, breastfeeding the infant Christ. 
A little bird, a coltit, is perched on the large tree behind her and feeds its young. Now Saint Jerome is kneeling before the Virgin, looking on in devotion, and he clutches the stone that is said to have pounded against his chest to help him resist temptation. And Saint Dominic kneels opposite, absorbed in the book he is reading, and he's holding a white lily. Now the white lily is a traditional attribute alluding, alluding to the Virgin's purity. And this is an altarpiece by Filippino Lippo. And this was on the chapel belonging to a member of the power, powerful Rucelli family in the important medieval churches of Florence. Now, what's really interesting here as well is that floriography was popular back in the early Renaissance. But then under the reign of Queen Victoria new standards of etiquette limited a communication across England's upper class. So what would happen is that many would send secret messages by way of flowers and then in turn books about floriography or the language of flowers became popular outlining the types of flowers that signalled flirtation, friendship, embarrassment or disdain. For example you might find that red roses indicate love the darker rose suggests shame, and pink roses sent the message that your love should be kept a secret. And flowers were used to communicate feelings that the strict etiquette of the Victorian era would not allow to be openly expressed. Now, the flowers were sent in the form of small bouquets known as tussy musses or nosegays. And they typically consisted of fragrant herbs and a single meaningful flower wrapped in lace. And suitors presented these tuzzimuzzies to their prospective lovers and watched to see how they were expect accepted. Now, what happened? How would you know if a potential lover accepted your advances? Well, if they held this tuzzimuzzie at heart level, well done, you've been accepted with joy. Held downwards, though, not this time, you've got to move on. To answer yes, the flowers are given in the right hand. To answer no, flowers are given in the left hand. So there was a huge revival of this floriography in the Victorian period. And here's an interesting painting. The Roses of Heliogabalus. Painted in 1888. A huge painting. Now, this is a tragic tale of Emperor Heliogabalus watching his guests suffocate under a shower of rose petals. Now, the original story specified violets as the nefarious flower. This artist here chose roses for his rendition, choosing the species specifically for its association with corruption and death. So, Alma Tadema painted it in London during the last few months of 1887 when it was too cold for roses to be blooming. In order to be able to paint the petals with precision, he demanded and arranged for roses to be shipped from the French Riviera every week for as long as it took to complete the artwork. And uh, now, here's a bit of background about the story. Heliogabalus is also known as Elagabalus, and a man who was juvenile and sadistic enough to dream something up so weird like this. He's the man lying down in the golden robe and tiara, watching with indifference as his banquet guests suffocate in the sudden petal deluge. Augustan history was the National Enquirer of the Roman Empire, and he said that uh, Heliogabalus overwhelmed his parasites, that is, his human dinner guests, with flowers that fell from behind the reversible ceiling of the banqueting room. Some of the guests were smothered to death, being unable to crawl out the top. Could this have actually happened or was it just about the power and personality of that emperor? Here's another painting, The Awakening of Adonis by uh, Waterhouse in 1900. Uh, Adonis was the mortal lover of the goddess Aphrodite in Greek mythology. And in Ovid's first century AD telling of the myth, he was conceived after Aphrodite cursed his mother Myrrha to lust after her own father, King Cinerus of Cyprus. Myrrha had sex with her father in complete darkness for nine nights, but he discovered her identity and chased her away with a sword. The gods transformed her into myrrh trees, and in the form of a tree she gave birth to Adonis. Now Aphrodite found the infant and gave him to be raised by Persephone, the queen of the underworld. 
Adonis grew into an astonishingly handsome young man, causing Aphrodite and Persephone to feud over him, with Zeus eventually decreeing that Adonis would spend one third of the year in the underworld with Persephone, and one third of the year with Aphrodite, and the final third of the year with whomever he chose. Adonis chose to spend his final third year of the year with Aphrodite. Um, one day, Adonis was gored by a wild boar during a hunting trip and died in Aphrodite's arms as she wept. His blood mingled with her tears and became the anemone flower. So due to its similarity to the poppy, used in art as a symbol of sorrow and death, often seen in scenes of crucifixion and also used in the early church as a symbol of the Trinity. So here the uh, anemone symbolises sleep and death. And the Rossetti painting, La Gurlandata. Now the title of this Rossetti painting is translated by the pre-Raphaelite artist's brother William Michael Rossetti as the garlanded lady or the lady of the wreath. Now largely interpreted as embodiment of love and beauty, Rossetti depicts a woman playing a harp as two angels surround her, enclosed by vivid flowers, including honeysuckle and roses, and luscious green foliage which melts into greens of her dress. The main model is Alexander Wilding, Wilding who uh, worked with Rossetti frequently. Painted in 1873, it belongs to this proper vibe of pre-Raphaelite art. The honeysuckle is actually a less common symbol of love and sweetness and also generosity. The blue flowers of poisoned monkshood represents that the viewer should be aware that there's a danger that might be ahead and that rests at the foot of the harp and topped with the beguiling honeysuckle and roses. Or at least that's what's intended. Um, he actually depicted the wrong flower here. He, he depicted the innocuous larkspur instead of monkshood. Uh, but it's supposed to be monkshood. Let's take a look at another Rossetti painting here. Venus Verticordia. And this means that Venus, the turner of hearts, and it derives from Latin literature where it designates the role of Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, in turning women's hearts towards virtue. However, Rossetti, as he would, interpreted it in the opposite sense to mean turning men's hearts away from fidelity. Now, this is evident from his sonnet in the picture. In the roses, the honeysuckle, apple and nude figure all contribute to the theme of love, sexuality. And this is almost the only example of a nude in Rossetti's work and he did often with Rossetti he would accompany his paintings with sonnets that would either be to the side or be painted on the frame that would also convey what he meant so the sonnet for this is she hath the apple in her hand for thee yet almost in her heart would hold it back she muses with her eyes upon the track of that which in thy spirit they can see Haply, behold, he is at peace, saith she. Alas, the apple for his lips, the dart that follows its brief sweetness to his heart, the wandering of his feet perpetually. A little space her glance is still and coy, but if she give the fruit that works her spell, those eyes shall flame as for Phrygian boy. Then shall her bird's strained throat the woeful foretell, and her far seas moan as a single shell, and through her dark grove strike the light of Troy. Now obviously the apple, if you think about it, is the symbol of unfaithfulness, because Eve gave it to Adam, um, even though they were told not to eat off that tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and bad. Another Rossetti, Veronica Veronese. The Pre-Raphaelites really ran with the uh, floriography theme with their work because of them painting more medieval ideas and feels and uh, Shakespearean um, images and biblical themes the floriography really went well with this and this was actually inspired by a Venetian painting believed to represent the artistic soul in the act of creation the theme is expounded by the fictitious quote inscribed on the frame of the painting and though the quote is attributed on the frame to the letters of Gralamo Rudolfi, critics believe that 
um, maybe Rossetti actually wrote it. And it says, suddenly leaning forward, the Lady Veronica rapidly wrote the first notes on the virgin page. Then she took the bow of her violin to make her dream reality. But before commencing to play the instrument hanging from her hand, she remained quiet a few moments, listening to the inspiring bird while her left hand strayed over the string, searching for the supreme melody, still elusive. It was the marriage of the voices of nature and the soul, the dawn of a mystic creation. So here we've got the symbolism of the uncaged bird, which may pre represent the marriage of the voices of nature and the soul. And we've got full-on overt flower symbolism here. The chamomile in the birdcage may represent energy and adversity. The primroses in the picture represent youth and the daffodils reflection because she's feeling very pensive. From 1889, Venus and Anchises by William Blake Richmond and this is the meeting at night of Venus and her earthly lover the Trojan shepherd Anchises on Mount Ida Venus clothed in a glowing pink and gold walks towards Anchises who waits holding a lyre now he's also clad in a red shirt appearing to cower in the shadow of a tree the usual penalty though for mortals such as her as he was for looking for a god or goddess was to be turned into stone the picture is not simple illustration of a mythical event though and it actually demonstrates the transforming power of love. Night has turned into day. In the bottom right of the picture there are, set, there are dead leaves of autumn but wherever Venus walks she becomes surrounded by spring flowers and apple blossom. She is accompanied by lions and a flight of doves which disperse a group of sparrows. Although the event depicted is rooted in ancient Greek mythology Richmond chooses to show the dramatic awakening of a northern landscape in an English spring. The offspring of the union between Venus and Anchises was Aeneas, the legendary ancestor of the Romans. Now there are also crocuses in this picture and um, they mean cheerfulness and the gladness of youth and the artist here included them in the spring flowers under Venus's feet. The primroses meaning actually changed with its colour a bit like the rose but yellow symbolised youth and young love used very deliberately here every aspect of her presence suggests his innocent youth from tacit gesture to her the, the pink dress so there we go yellow primroses meaning young love and youth here though we've got the Daughters of Our Empire, England, The Primrose by Edwin Long. And again, deliberately, with the pink um, dress, that's what I was on about earlier, I clicked the wrong painting, um, the I can't live without you kind of love. That's what this means. Ev so we've got innocence, um, the pink dress, short trimmed hair fashionable style among young ladies at the time but the focal point point in this piece is the bundle of yellow primrose flowers she's gathered in her skirt young love or uh, lilac tinted primroses actually signify confidence and red primroses symbolize unprecedented merit so the artist was very careful using the yellow primrose fitting its context with the painting subject Now, here is a very famous painting by Millet, Ophelia. Filled with floriography. But what's interesting is the floriography is either based because it was written in Hamlet and mentioned, or symbolically to refer to what the scening means so we've got daisies floating near Ophelia's right hand and they represent innocence nettles growing around the willow's branches in the background represent pain the pink roses that float by Ophelia's cheek and her dress um, and the white field roses growing on the riverbank may refer to symbolic meanings as love youth and beauty and there are a garland of a garland of violets around Ophelia's neck and they refer um, to a quote in Hamlet where she says, I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. 
And violets are a symbol of faithfulness and they can also symbolise chastity and the death in the young. In this picture there are also meadow sweet flowers to the left of the purple loose strife and they signify the futility of Athelia's death. And the pale blue forget-me-nots on the riverbank uh, below the purple loose strife and in the immediate foreground carry their meaning in their name, forget-me-not. Now pansies, now they're floating on the dress uh, in the centre and they refer to where Ophelia gathers flowers in the field and she says that's for thoughts. Now what's interesting, pansy comes from the French pensée meaning to think and they represent thought and can also mean love in vain and then we've got the vivid red poppy with its black seeds representing sleep and death which you may be familiar with. So that's just a quick look at a few symbols of floriography in art throughout the centuries. I hope you found that enjoyable and maybe has given you uh, an insight and an urging to look up more flower symbolism as you study art.